Hi, I'm Adriana McIntyre. I'm the managing editor at The Incidental Economist, and I'm here with... Uh, Yevgeny Feynman. I'm a, uh, a fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research, where I focus on healthcare policy. So we're going to chat about uh, healthcare and a, a bit about Ebola, because um, it was just announced that Obama is going to be appointing Ron Klain as the Ebola czar. Uh, so, Yevgeny, did you want to give a little bit of your understanding of what the Ebola czar is going to do? Because Twitter just kind of exploded with the word czar this morning. Um, but there didn't seem to be a very clear understanding of what Ron Klain will be doing in his capacity as the Ebola czar. Yeah, I think uh, the, this is going to have a lot of uh, misunderstandings going around. Some people would have wanted someone who's a doctor, who's got these fancy medical credentials. But really, the, this position is supposed to be uh, political. It's a management position. It's someone who can go and liaise with states, with different federal agencies. He's the one who's going to be the point person for everything that the federal government wants to do where they need uh, the help of states with. So he's uh, he's he's in an interesting position, um, but he's not going to affect the overall uh, public health uh, public health efforts directly. He could just rope in more states and more more participants to help them out, I think. Right. Um, I heard somebody describe him as the chief of staff for Ebola, which I think is really interesting because this was before my friend realized that he had actually been the chief of staff for both <laughs> Joe Biden and Al Gore. Um, so he really is a political person. He is not a um, medical expert of any kind. He's a lawyer by training, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's what I've been reading about him. And I, I think his chief of staff uh, experience definitely uh, speaks well of him. Um, he's had some interesting experience. Apparently, he had something to do with uh, with a loan that was given out to Solyndra at one point. But hmm. you know, you're you're, you're going to have things come up on the left and right. Uh, you know, good things, bad things about him. People are going to dig up dirt. Uh, what, when, when it comes down to it, you know, I, I don't know much about his management credentials. I don't know how he is as a manager, but it seems like people in the administration think that he's this good mix of policy and management. Right, right. And this is something that's actually like a weirdly sensitive issue because Ebola has become politicized more so than I would expect a communicable, de communicable disease, a tragedy in West Africa. Um, to become a domestic political issue. But it really has been um, between the Republicans, um, many of them pursuing a travel ban and Democrats pointing to Republican cuts to uh, the medical research budget as a potential reason that we haven't seen uh, more research and development on an Ebola vaccine. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think... Both both of those accusations um, have a little bit of uh, truth behind them. I mean, a, a travel ban would obviously keep people with Ebola from coming into the U.S., but it wouldn't address the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. You're not going to treat Ebola at its source with a travel ban. And right. at the same time, the NIH funding, that all goes to basic research, which is amazing. I've always said that we should be funding the NIH much more. But one year, two years of NIH funding, of basic research funding, isn't going to change the economic incentives that face an Ebola vaccine. It's not going to make an Ebola vaccine get through the, the FDA, uh, like Sarah Cliff pointed out in her Vox article. Right. Um, I wanted to go back to the travel ban because that's something that I've actually discussed with people. And I um, have had friends who have actually asked me, like, why don't we just ban travel? And I think it's worth articulating that that's probably not going to solve the problem um, because we both want to be able to get aid into the countries. And if we have aid workers in the countries, we want to be able to get them out. But also um, the less appreciated angle, I think, is that people who are infected would just hide the fact that they've been in those countries and they there are other porous borders within Africa. So somebody could leave Liberia, find their way to another country, and then fly to the United States. And then we wouldn't have a red flag to tell us, hey, this is a person we maybe want to monitor. Um, so I, I think that the efforts to instigate a travel ban are misguided, but I would be curious if you disagree. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm an open borders guy, period. So I think... Uh... When, when it comes to anything, uh, preventing illegal immigration, uh, stopping uh, you know, criminal cartels from entering the U.S., closing borders off doesn't do that. If, uh, if, if you want to get into a country really badly, you're going to figure out a way to do it. 
uh, we, we, you, you can never perfectly shut off a border. You can never perfectly track everyone who's coming in, especially in, uh, in, in the globalized age that we live in. So I, I, I don't think that a travel ban would significantly do anything for the U.S. Um, you know, may, may, maybe keep, uh, keep some people out. It won't keep others out, but it would drastically hurt people in West Africa and it would drastically limit our ability to actually treat the situation in West Africa. Um, I think, there, there's there's a huge humanitarian argument against having a travel ban. Right, right. And I think that, I don't know if you saw the clip of Shep Smith that has been circulating the internet. Um, no, no. He, I think he articulated it really well. Like the politics angle of this is it, it's really midterms are coming up. And so um, the majority party, the Democrats, want to prove that they are showing leadership. And so that's why Obama is holding these press conferences, appointing a czar, and the Republicans are interested in demonstrating a lack of leadership. And so they're calling for things that the administration probably won't pursue, like a travel ban. Yeah, um, I, I, I think that's completely on point. Um, it's, uh, it, like you said earlier, it's unfortunate politics has made its way into this much more than we would have liked, especially because Ebola is this. Uh, so it's, it's an issue that, that you'd hope would be more unifying uh, between the parties. Right. right. Um, so let's go back to the vaccine issue, because I know you know a lot about that sort of thing. Um, and and I, I, the general sense is it's wrong. My general sense is it's wrong to suggest that a better budget situation would have guaranteed a vaccine would be ready for many reasons. But the first of those being that's not how science works, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. We don't know that with a billion dollars more funding, we would have found that cure, we would have been able to manufacture that cure. So can you talk a little bit more about the process that um, is involved in getting a vaccine approved and on market? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll add the caveat that obviously, I'm not a biologist, I'm not I'm not a chemist. So um, I'm, so, I'm still speaking <laughs> a bit from, uh, from an outsider's perspective in, in that sense. But we, we have very ancient rules, first of all, for getting drugs approved, we have a system that costs uh, over a billion dollars that takes 12 years to get uh, an average drug approved. Now, uh, we, we have processes for expediting that that came about during the AIDS crisis in the 80s. Uh, the FDA brought out accelerated approval and other approaches in the 90s, which helped get AIDS and cancer drugs uh, through the pipeline very quickly to the people who need them. Vaccines are a really unique situation because as opposed to the AIDS crisis, as opposed to uh, cancer broadly, you have just tiny, tiny populations. You have, uh, you know, maybe nine or 10,000 people right now around the world that we've identified with Ebola. Uh, even for really rare diseases like chronic myeloid leukemia, you have a patient population that's bigger than that, 30,000, and those people are in the U.S., so they can better afford the drugs. Um, the economic incentives just aren't there. You need a bulk purchaser. You need DOD, CDC, uh, HHS's BARDA initiative to be helping uh, actually create the, the incentive to us by, by saying, you know, if you get this to market, we're going to go and buy, I don't know, 50,000 vials of the of the vaccine. Um, you, you, you could give the NIH some extra funding. I mean, over 10 years, it might have made a bit of a difference if the NIH was better funded, if it was more predictably funded uh, under Clinton. We doubled the NIH's budget uh, over a very short period of time, so it created some unrealistic expectations. Uh, increasing the NIH budget uh, more smoothly over time would have been better, but the NIH doesn't get drugs to market. Uh, companies do. The government isn't good at doing that, and we've, we, we've, we've kind of forgotten that. We've said, you know, here, research the really uh, basic understanding of the, of the disease, figure out uh, how to target it, what... Uh, biochemical markers can be used but then we've just stepped back and said all right now now it's on you and no one's going to run a randomized trial for ebola it's it's unethical right right, right. well yeah, for, yes um i think another thing is you know this is an outbreak that obviously nobody predicted um it's the worst outbreak in history like you said nine to ten thousand people probably by now um infected and the last largest outbreak was about 300 people or 400 people so when you say the market's not there, it's really, really not there. It's the sort of thing that right. we don't anticipate being a problem, in, particularly in high-income countries. So there are problems because there are problems with um, that low-income countries face, and that's a whole 
ethical quagmire in itself. How do we fund research for diseases that don't afflict high income countries where there are good markets? Um, but even in low income countries, Ebola is just not necessarily considered a pressing issue. It, it wasn't until this outbreak. Right. Um, so I, I think it's really hard to make any argument about what would have made the difference between having the vaccine and not having the vaccine. Yeah, the the, the counterfactual is always very, very difficult to, to figure out, and uh, no one's really good at that. And I, I think you, you made a really good point, um, and I, I think that this, this can lead us into, into another way of looking at Ebola, um, uh, talking about the current situation. Um, the fact that even in developing countries, there are more pressing issues. In African countries, you have malaria. That's still a big problem. You have African sleeping sickness, which uh, has very few treatments. Um, and uh, we, we're we paying a lot of attention to Ebola right now. The, the media is really, really covering it uh, th through and through. But 5,000 people annually, at least in the U.S., die from, from the flu. Uh, right, right. And so everyone's saying, go get the flu vaccine, which if you are watching this and you don't have your flu vaccine, yes, go please, get vaccinated. Please do. It's not going to, it's not going to cause autism. No, no, it is really not. <laughs> um, so another thing about Ebola, and this has been covered pretty thoroughly by the media itself, but is uh, media hype and whether the media has been saying panic or don't panic or, and it's not entirely clear to me how many people are actually panicking. Um, but to the extent that they are, it's probably the media's fault. I don't know if you saw the Instagram of the woman at Dulles uh, no, no. in her homemade hazmat suit. Oh my God. There is a fantastic <laughs> Instagram photo. I will send it to you after this call. Um, and of a woman, she's, she's wearing like a plastic suit and gloves and a mask like a f and a hood, and that's just not necessary. <laughs> Even if you were flying to Africa, to to Liberia, like that's not necessary. There, to, to contract Ebola, you really need to have intimate contact with somebody. You need to um, have contact with their bodily fluids, and that is yeah. not likely to happen on a plane. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, that that's that's one of the problems here, right? We we were talking about this uh, a little bit earlier, but with the media giving Ebola so much attention, uh, school districts are starting to react irrationally. People right. are acting irrationally. I mean, this is uh, this, it's getting a little bit ridiculous. Right. I, I read that uh, school districts in Texas and Ohio closed. I think it was yep. um, after the flight, the, the nurses' flight. One one of the nurses who was infected um, after caring for the patient flew from. Cleveland back to somewhere in Texas, Dallas. Um, and, and it was after she'd been infected, but before she was symptomatic, meaning she probably was not contagious at the time. But these school districts closed, which is a totally irrational, inefficient, yeah. wasteful way to react to this. <laughs> well, um, you, you, you've got to react somehow, right? So if, right. if, if you can react in an inefficient, wasteful way, then you do it. I suppose. Um, some, some other things I read about, um, there was a journalist who had been invited to speak at Syracuse after traveling, um, through some of the countries that are affected and they actually rescinded his invite. And I think it's been two or three weeks since he returned. I'm, I'm wow. pretty sure he's passed the window of if he was going to have symptoms, he would exhibit them. Um, so that's just really, really ridiculous. And they actually asked him, would you like to Skype in? And he said no, <laughs> because he did not want to perpetuate the myth that there was anything um, potentially problematic about him being there in person. Uh, so I have to commend him for that. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that takes a lot of guts, I think. Yeah. There's also um, a school, a, a college somewhere in Texas that is denying admit, uh, admission to international students from affected countries, which just seems wrong on so many levels. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, look, I, I think I think the, the CDC made a mistake when when they said, you know, there this this woman who has a uh, near 100 degree fever and who was treating the Ebola patient. Yeah, she can go fly. Right. Um, the, that was a mistake on the CDC on the CDC's part, but obviously the hospital had their own mistakes earlier. Uh, at, at, at the same time, it doesn't warrant any anything near that that level of, of reaction from Syracuse from the school districts. You've you you've got to get, uh, try getting across the message that yes, this is bad, but 
we still have a functional public health infrastructure. We can right. we can manage this and we know enough about the virus to be able to say, you know, if this guy doesn't have symptoms two weeks after, he's not contagious. You, We can be certain of that. I think it's worth talking about the hospital too, because there were definitely errors from oh, 100%. Texas Presbyterian. Um, so the first patient presented to the hospital um, a few weeks, the, the first patient in the United States presented to a hospital in Dallas a few weeks ago, and he was sent home, right? He was sent home, yeah, even though exactly. he had communicated to one of his providers that he had, he was a Liberian national. Um, so A, he should not have been sent home. Like that should have been communicated <laughs> to the flag. doctor. Right, right. Um, and something that I think is really interesting is uh, the way that the hospital had initially blamed the electronic health record. Right. I don't know if you remember that. Um, yep. But it's like, you may not like your electronic health records, but it is not there to be your fall guy. No, no, I, I, absolutely like, not. Uh, you know, th th there's something to be said for how we're implementing EHRs. Uh, with, you know, the, the hospital, I guess, has three different EHRs, one for nursing, one for inpatient, one for outpatient. Um, and they're not interoperable. So that's that's the hospital's fault. The, the hospital should be making sure that whatever the nurses put into their EHR, into their health record, goes with a patient when they're inpatient or outpatient when they're seeing the doctor. That should all be available. But it wasn't. That's on the hospital. That has nothing to do with the EHR itself. Right, right. And the hospital later walked back their um, blaming the EHR, which yeah, was kind yeah. of interesting in itself. Um, but And they're, they're, they've got this PR campaign now on Twitter uh, asking people to tweet about how safe the hospital is. Right. But for a while, it sounds like the providers um, who were, you know, caring for the patient didn't have adequate uh, gear. Like they were not dressed properly yeah. to be caring for a patient who was severely ill with Ebola. Um, somebody, somewhere they had written that they were taping up, uh, you know, taping ga their gown to something else so that there wasn't um, any holes and it's there there's actual there are actual suits for this that you should be wearing if you're um, working with a patient with this kind of uh, disease right uh, apparently they, they they were wearing regular face masks instead of uh, I think the the respirator masks mm -hmm. so yeah the the there were definitely some protocols that weren't followed I think they have def they've definitely improved because um, I don't know if you saw but the uh, one of the nurses who was affected had a video out this morning or yesterday afternoon, um, where she's talking to her colleagues. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, it, uh, training. It, it's 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 right. it's something that hospitals obviously haven't had to worry about. Uh, they they never really thought that they that they'd need to be reacting to an Ebola outbreak. So, right. You know, why why put in money into into public health training and. It's it's kind of understandable, but it's also obviously really unfortunate because that's that, that's where we get these kind of mistakes. Right. And I think that there's also an element of, you know, this is focusing our attention on hospital performance in a way that the public is rarely focused. Right. Um, Absolutely. And, and so we know that medical errors have people who follow health policy ha know that medical errors have been a problem forever, basically. Yes. Um, we've gotten a little bit better at them with things like checklists and uh, various other protocols, but we're nowhere near perfect. And I think that this is just a really unfortunate but excellent case study in the fact that there is a lot of um, room for improvement in the way that we deliver care. Yeah, w without a doubt. I think, there, like you said, there's a lot of room for improvement in how we deliver care, also how, how we track the safety of hospitals. Uh, a lot of the data is is tucked away. It's hidden from the public. Um it's uh, it's 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 not available even to to a lot of researchers and right the, the, there's simple things like data on never events you know things that just should never happen a lot of hospitals refuse to release that information uh you've you've got some groups that are trying to pull something together from interviews with hot with hospitals you know guaranteeing them anonymity and things like that but it's so so limited uh i i hope you're right that this is going to direct public attention towards hospital performance in a way that they hadn't paid attention before Right. Um, so I guess we can move on to other health reform issues, since that's what the original purpose of this call was yes, going to be. Yes, there was not Ebola. Before. There was not Ebola when we planned this no. call. Well, there was, but it was not nearly this. 
prominent. Um, so, the Affordable Care Act Year 2. It's going to be interesting. Um, I think it has the potential, at least for people who follow health policy closely, to be even more interesting than Year 1. Because uh, it's kind of, you know, Year 1 was a ramp up of efforts and there was a lot of attention. And so the attention is going to subside, the media attention. Um, and we'll see how Obamacare go- how Obamacare uh, works when it's not constantly in the spotlight. I don't think the spotlight's going away completely. I just don't think it will be quite as bright. Yeah, I, I think I think you're right. Um, for the most part, I think the spotlight's going to be on different parts of it. So mm-hmm. we're we're probably going to see the you know quote unquote insure bailout question come up again with oh, yes. the 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 three R's: uh, reinsurance, uh, risk adjustment, and risk corridors. Um, because 20, 2015, I think, is the first year that they're going to have to make the payments. Uh, right. so, so they're going to be making the payments for 2014. And, you know, un- unfortunately, I, if, if Republicans take the Senate, I think that's something they're going to try to block. Uh, I think they're going to try to block it, uh, regardless of whether they take the Senate. But that, that's, that's going to be an important, an important piece of it. It's, it's going to be framed as, you know, artificially, uh, keeping rates down and keep and keeping people from seeing the full cost, and you know, I, I, to, to some extent, I think that's true. But the, the counterfactual is any any health reform is going to have those uh, the, the, those right. those kind of methods, <laughs> right? So we know that Medicare Part D, right, has those. Um, yes, yes, they they so they have permanent permanent risk corridors, permanent, permanent risk, risk corridors, ex- not exactly. temporary <laughs> risk corridors. It's it's not like this is some new newfangled thing that the Obama administration came up with no. for health reform. No, this is no. a, a very normal feature of insurance reform. And you say the counterfactual, the alternate reality where we don't have risk corridors is that insurers are much less certain about their bottom lines, and so they hike rates, and so the money still gets paid. It just gets paid directly through premiums. Yeah. Um, and we see higher premiums as a result. Right. And you, you have a higher chance for adverse selection uh, because then uh, so some, some plans will be adverse selected against. Right. They're, they're, they're going to have right. a much sicker pool and without the ability to. So if, if they don't have a large enough pool to, to balance that out, they're just going to get uh, screwed out of the market. Uh, they're they're going to have much, much higher rates and uh, it, 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 it becomes less stable. You know, we we, right. we saw we saw the ultimate death spiral actually play out in New York. No one wants that. Um, and I'll, right. I'll also add, it's not only Part D that has uh, risk adjustment measures. Uh, Medicare Advantage uh, right, also right. D- does have risk adjustment, much right. much heavier risk adjustment than what we're doing on on Obamacare. Right. Um, I don't know that I'm as confident as you that Congress can do much of anything about the risk corridors. So. There's there's some controversy over whether or not the Obama administration can appropriate the money to the insurers for the risk orders. Um, the GAO recently came out with a report uh, a few weeks ago saying that they didn't think that the way the law was written, um, the, the administration could kind of dole out that money. But the GAO's report isn't a binding document. No, And no. so it's possible that, you know, the Senate won't choose to appropriate for this for these programs, but it's possible that the administration will go ahead and appropriate that money anyways. And there are, I won't get into them here in part because I don't remember them offhand, but there are legal defenses. Um, there's a different, the, the Obama administration used one justification for their uh, method of funding the risk quarters. There's an alternate justification that Nicholas Bagley, a law professor yeah. at uh, the University of Michigan has proposed that they didn't pursue. Um, that might be more solid grounds legally. Um, and if they are challenged on the approach they took, they could just fall back to that alternate justification. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's, it's, it's basically either a user fee or a revolving fund. Um, so the, 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 the user fee, I think, is, is what HHS decided to go with. And then the revolving door mm-hmm. fund, that, that's, that's what uh, Nicholas Bagley proposed. Um, I, bo- both are really interesting. Uh, they're, they're, they're creative interpretations. I think it's, uh, it's, it's a nice way to get around that, that opposition you're going to face. Um, there, there, there are some problems with the revolving door fund, but I, I, I think if, if Republicans take the Senate, what, what, what they're going to try to do is simply uh, get rid of that section. You know, so for, for, for forget appropriations, they're just going to try to pair, pair that section out of the law. 
Right, but Obama would never let that happen. Oh, no, happen. no, I, I, absolutely not. I, <laughs> the, the veto power is still there. <laughs> right. I, I, I don't think it's politically realistic, but that's definitely something that they're going to try to do, um, whether it's good policy or not. Okay, so what else do you think might happen if the Senate takes, uh, the, the Senate is taken by Republicans in 2016? You know, I, I think one, one thing we, we, we can all agree on, I, I think, and, and to, to tell me if you don't, is that the, the employer mandate um, probably should, should go away. Uh, it, it doesn't have a major effect on the law. It makes it a little bit uh, more surplus positive, so it generates uh, some revenues. But uh, the, the Urban Institute, I think, did an analysis recently that said, that the, the, the difference in actual coverage rates would be pretty minimal. Right, and right. It's, it's, it's a little bit schizophrenic to say on the one hand, you know, hey, employers, you uh, over over 50 workers, you have to offer health insurance, while on, on the other hand saying, you know, we're, we're also going to make it much, much harder for you to offer that insurance with a Cadillac tax, which, which I think is good policy, uh, just, uh, just so, so, so that's out there. But the, the employer mandate, I think, is where, where the Republicans can make their first kind of tear into, into the ACA. Right. And I think that the, the employer mandate and employer sponsored insurance in general is one of those places where the wonks or the academics or whatever you want to call them, uh, they're kind of in agreement on both sides of the aisle. Like employer sponsored insurance is not a great idea. Um, subsidizing employer sponsored insurance right. and tying insurance to employers. It's not a great idea. And to the extent that the employer mandate entrenches that as a practice, like health economists don't like it. We would like to see it repealed. Um, and, and that's something that, you know, Ezra Klein has come out and said, um, Tim Jost, I think when the Urban Institute study came out, he also wrote a small editorial, um, I think echoing the same idea. But uh, the thing is, if we, there is revenue attached to that. Right. There's revenue attached to the penalties. So the problem is if we repeal it, it we need to pay for. And I don't know what that would be. I don't, I don't know what we could get Congress to agree on Um to cover the difference if we were to get rid of the employer mandate. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really not not easy figuring out how how you pay for it. Um, and it's 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 a little bit unfortunate. Uh, I I because I I think the the revenue over 10 years is relatively minimal. Uh, you know, given given everything else we're we're, we're spending. Given that healthcare is giant. Yes, yes. <laughs> as, as as a share of the yeah, you know, making it up fifty six trillion dollars we'll spend on healthcare <laughs> over that time period. It's it's right. it's a fraction, and it's it's just good policy not to have it. Um, I th I think m maybe this is somewhere where Republicans would be willing to just uh t take the hit because it, politically it just it makes sense for them to get rid of the employer mandate. They can go back to their constituents to business groups and say, hey, look, we got right. we got rid of the employer mandate. I mean that's that's just a huge, huge win for them. And it might be worth taking a bit of a hit on the deficit. Right. And, and I don't think it's, so some people defend the employer mandate and say, you know, employers will drop insurance if it's not mandated. But I think that that's just not a realistic thing to say. We didn't have an employer mandate before the Affordable Care Act. And, you know, most people, the majority of insured Americans did receive their insurance through their employer. Um, it, it remains a cultural part of our labor force. And so it's still going to be a recruitment and retention mechanism. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I'm with you. Like, we agree on many things. This is one of them <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that the employer mandate could go. And I think that of the changes of the more sweeping changes to the Affordable Care Act that are available, that's maybe one of the most realistic um, more realistic in repealing risk corridors and other risk adjustment programs. More re one of the other issues that, um, or one of the other potential changes that might be realistic is introducing a, what do they call it? Uh, it's below the bronze plan. That they have a name for it. Oh, the um, copper plan. The copper right. plan, yes. Yeah, so uh, that's uh, that, that's what uh, Begich, uh, ironically, you know, Begich is a Democrat. He He proposed that idea to have this, 50% actuarial value plan. It's, it's basically the catastrophic plan, just calling it something different and making it eligible for mm -hmm. subsidies. So, uh, you know, you, you do that, that, that might, uh, get, get, get you some, some lower spending actually to, to help counteract the, the getting rid of the employer mandate. If you, uh, you, you think that some people who, uh, who are subsidy eligible would, that would have gone into bronze plans before now end up in copper plans, you're, you're just spending less in, uh, 
in in, in subsidies. So I, I'm I'm not sure that it'll it'll help very much, but at the margins, it might give you a little bit to play with. Right, and it's it's a political win more than it's you know a policy or economic win. I think if they were to pursue that and win, um, because that is something that uh, moderate Democrats and less so, but moderate Republicans um, might coalesce around. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 one of these options that's very realistic. Um, it. It, it it makes sense for 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 conservative reforms, you know, that that, that want to see more more HSAs, more uh, you know, skin in the game, and for 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 Democrats, um, and for, for for moderate Democrats, uh, surprisingly, it makes sense. I was I was a little bit surprised to see that 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 some some blue dog Democrats do support it. Um, so you if if you can get that support, it looks even better because it's not just Republicans, uh, you know, pushing it through on a on a partisan uh, partisan line. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So another thing that would be really great if we could actually fix it is the family glitch, which yeah. is something that I think few people are actually aware <laughs> of. Um, correct me if I explain this incorrectly, but my understanding is that um, when it's in order to be eligible for subsidies, you need to demonstrate that you don't have access to affordable coverage through your employer. Um, And so if I were to have a family and I were to have access to an insurance plan for my employer, I wouldn't be eligible for subsidies, even if my income was very low. The problem is my employer could just offer me single coverage, coverage for just me, but not my family. And that would make me ineligible for subsidies. It would make my whole family ineligible for subsidies, even though my plan won't cover them. So that's actually a really big problem. And that's something that I think has been correctly characterized as a glitch in the law. Like it's not something that the people who wrote the law intended, um, but it's also not the sort of thing that can be brushed away with an administrative fix in the way that certain other things have been changed. And you can, we can quibble over the legitimacy of certain delays and changes that the administration has made unilaterally. (laughs) Um, there is, has been and will continue to be a lot of debate about those changes. But this is one of those things that we really need congressional action to fix it. It's there. There's no way to just kind of change the law, change the interpretation of the law. Right. It, it's uh, it affects, I think, about two million people was uh, one one of the recent estimates. And you know, it, it's 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 a byproduct of having having this uh, this employer sponsored system. Um, you know, there there are different ways of, of fixing it. I guess you you could um, make uh, so subsidies flow by by individual uh, rather than rather than just based on on family income. So if uh, if if you 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 get offered only a only a single plan through through your employer, you could still allow subsidies to flow uh, for for the child. Or right, you know, and the, the, this is less palatable for conservatives, but maybe just allow the child to go on chip. If, mm-hmm. if if they're if they're which under is Medicaid, right? Yeah. Which is Medicaid for people who don't follow health policy acronyms <laughs> super closely. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's another thing that I would love to actually see happen with a productive Congress. I don't know if we're going to see that in the you know upcoming year or two, um, but it would be great if we did. It would be great if it just got tacked onto some piece of bipartisan right. legislation that right. was totally unrelated to the ACA. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's something that maybe uh, staffers wouldn't pay too much attention to. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I get the feeling that if they're very focused on some of the big picture language of a particular bill, something like that can get slipped in there, you know. Right. Um, and and actually, while I'm at it, I'll I'll, I'll pitch my 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 own personal pre- preferred fix, uh, which I, I just uh, wrote a Forbes post about this, uh, which is basically to let employers just top off. Uh, pre-tax uh, what, what, whatever subsidies you're getting. So uh, it helps move us away from ESI coverage, but also it, it's, it's a roundabout way of, of addressing the glitch because if employers can just top off, they'll, they'll drop coverage and you're, you're, you're still entitled to, to whatever subsidies you were before because um, your, your actual income won't change since the, uh, the, whatever your employer is giving you is pre-tax. Right. Right. Another thing that we might call a glitch, although it, may be resolved. I'm not sure if you heard about this, but there has been some discussion of whether or not employers can offer plans that don't cover hospital care. Yeah. I, yeah. Have you heard about that? I've, I've, yeah. I've been following that a little bit, not, not too much in depth, but it's, it seems like it's basically, it's, it's a kind of intentional glitch with the calculator. 
Right. So the way that um, employers figure out whether their plans meet the minimum value requirement uh, kind of stipulated by the ACA is they go to this calculator mm-hmm. and they put in their benefits, right? That's how this works. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And, and, they, and if the, the calculator tells them, yes, this meets minimum value or no, this doesn't. <laughs> and so the calculator has apparently been designed such that plans can offer certain benefits, but not cover inpatient hospital care, which is right. very expensive. Um, and still meet minimum value. And that's the sort of thing that could drive families into bankruptcy. You know, if you have a medical problem and it requires a hospital stay, that's not going to be cheap. Um, I, I did read recently, I don't think there are many details yet, but it sounds like the administration is reevaluating the calculator. Uh, I, I read something on that a couple days ago on the Washington Post, I think. Yeah, I, I briefly saw some some article headline that, that they're they're looking to redo the you know, the calculator. But I, I've I've got to wonder how much of of a glitch that really is because the, the, this isn't uh, it's not it's not legislators it's not staffers making these calculators it's folks at uh, CMS at HHS it's uh, actuaries. So you 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 think these are really really detail oriented people they wouldn't have uh, missed something like this. So. I, I, I really don't know. I don't know to what extent it's an oversight versus something intentional that maybe uh, the political elites didn't didn't realize, but that mm-hmm. the people actually responsible for putting together the calculator uh, understood uh, could allow some really, really cheap plans to still make the cut. Right. And the other thing that concerns me is, you know, it's already 2014. Yes. It's already October 2014. <laughs> and... You would have thought that we would have figured this out by now. Like that worries me. This is this is the sort of thing that I don't think is the intention of people who wrote health reform. It, no. When they said that, when they said, you know, we want to define a package of essential health benefits to make sure that everybody has adequate coverage. Those essential health benefits don't apply to all plans in the employer market. But the idea was there is a certain floor of coverage that people should have access to, and generally that floor of coverage would include hospital care. Yeah, you because you'd hope so. That's, a, that's something you would want to insure against. Right. That's something that you wouldn't anticipate having for the most part. I mean, it it actually it makes much more sense having insurance that only covers hospital care and doesn't cover anything else because that that's a real catastrophic cost. You know, God forbid you end up in the hospital for a week, two weeks. That's that's the kind of cost that insurance should be covering. Uh, the everyday costs are easier, right? That's that's not right. that's not something that's going to drive you into bankruptcy. It requires more trade offs, but. You know, you're you're in an ambulance. You end up in the emergency room, get admitted. That's not something you plan for. That's something right. that just me- messes up your finances for a long, long time. Right, right. Um, and I mean, we. I would probably disagree with you about the extent to which insurance should cover preventative care because I just I tend to be of the opinion that it's good to cover certain things, and it, it's really at the margins that. Um, even w- within people who support the ACA, there, there's a debate over how much preventive care the ACA should cover, how much is too much, how much... If you cover too much care, there's a fear that people will use care that they don't need. Right. Um, but well, I, I don't know that it's worth... Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I, I just, just to clarify, I, I do think a plan should be covering uh, preventive care generally. Uh, I... I I am one of those people who at the margins just wonders how much preventive care we should be covering. Uh, Even before the Mm -hmm. ACA, your your typical high deductible plan usually covered uh, preventive care because they understood that it can reduce their their costs long term if they can keep the patient on the plan long enough. So they'd still cover, you know, whatever uh, wellness screenings or your physical, um, whatever else. Um, it's, it's, It's just a question at the margin of how much. Uh, and what what preventive care really should be without cost sharing versus a little bit of cost sharing, but that's that's kind of beyond the scope of you know the, what, what what we're talking about. I think right, right, yeah. And I mean, I think we talked about this probably in our last blogging heads, but I think it's underappreciated just how much the change in the price of health plans is driven by patient characteristics and not changes in benefits. It, it I think it has a lot more to do with the fact that. Now we're rating plans so that um, sick people and healthy people are paying the same. That makes these plans more attractive to people who actually need health care. Um, and I think that that drives the changes in costs much more than arguing that these benefits are too expansive. Right. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a weird combination. I mean, I, I, 
I, I and you know, I'm not an actuary either. I'm not a lot of things. So I, I <laughs> we are both not many things. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know to what extent, um, you know, moving from uh, 50% actuarial value uh, to 60 or 70% increase of the cost versus, uh, so, so when you do that, you, you bring in obviously sicker people, you bring in people that need care a little bit more, you need, you bring in poorer people. So mm-hmm. there, there are those two effects happening simultaneously and which one is really, really responsible for what aspect of the cost increase or cost change. It's, it's really, really difficult to figure out. It's like when, when you deal with supply and demand, does supply affect demand? Does demand affect supply? It's it both happen at the same time. Right. Um, although for what it's worth, I wrote about this much earlier in the summer, but Mark Pauly had a paper, a working paper on this. And I think that his estimates were a 14 to 24% increase in the price of right. insurance plans for people who had had plans before the ACA. And in his estimation, this was primarily driven by the change in the patient mix, sick and healthy people. Um, and and have and having to equalize those costs. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember that's uh, where, uh, that, that's that's um, his his paper with uh, Scott Harrington, I think. Yes, um, yes, yes. And uh, you know, even even there, I'm, I'm not sure to what extent the, their their particular methodology could d- dissociate the, this the specific differences. And I, I'm I'm not talking about in, uh, to total benefits. So I'm not I'm not talking about moving from zero. Uh, essential health benefits to 10 essential health benefits, but specifically on the actuarial value front, uh, what, what share of the cost the plan covers. It's, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if, if their methodology really allowed them to, to, to say definitively that, you know, this, this portion of, of the cost increase is completely due to the patient mix, um, especially if the patient mix changed because of the increase in actuarial value. Okay, we are probably veering into technical land <laughs> yes, that we uh, yeah, shouldn't. I, I think so. So let's move on to court cases because uh, it's incredibly possible that the Affordable Care Act will be back in the Supreme Court next year. Um, so for watchers who haven't followed this closely, there are four lawsuits progressing on um, the claim that 36 states should not actually have access to the tax credits that offset the cost of insurance. Uh, The way that the lawsuit is set up, um, the the way that the case is set up, states could either establish their own exchanges and have state-based exchanges, or they could default to federally run exchanges, which is essentially healthcare.gov. And the way the law was written, the part of the law that calculates the subsidies only refers to the other part of the law that sets up the state-based exchanges. It does not refer to the part of the law that sets up federally facilitated exchanges. Um, and so there are arguments, you know, that the way the law was written, taken fully in context, it's obvious that the uh, writers intended subsidies to float all exchanges. But right now we have um, four lawsuits, two that have already been resolved at the circuit court level. Um, and one of those has been appealed to the Supreme Court. So do you want to say uh, a bit about the uh, circuit decisions or do you want to? <laughs> yeah, you know, so there, the, in the, the, the King lawsuit, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, the, the circuit basically sided with, uh, with, with, with the government. They, they mm-hmm. said that, no, um, the, the intent was uh, clearly that, that they they want to offer subsidies on on all exchanges. It wouldn't make sense otherwise. So uh, they uh, put they 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 did dismiss the case. Um, and now the the petitioners in King are requesting review from the Supreme Court. Uh, right, right. Now the 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 other big case, the 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 one that's that's gotten a lot of attention, Halbig. Halbig and King came out on the same day, I think. Mm-hmm. So yes. That was a very exciting day for health policy. Yeah, journalists. yeah, it was. It was, it was a very, it was a very <laughs> schizophrenic day for us. Yeah. Um, and uh, in 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 Halbig, it was the exact opposite. The 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 circuit mm-hmm. court said, yeah, well, this actually makes a lot of sense. Um, the 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 IRS went too far in their statutory interpretation, and uh, the 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 plain text uh, reading of the law says that only. Uh, only, only the state-based exchanges uh, can can have access to the subsidies, and there, there are a lot of arguments. I I don't remember which which specific arguments were were used here uh, to to argue that, but I think part of it 
was that um, it's it's an incentive to to to, to push states mm-hmm. into into setting up their own exchanges because uh, if you don't set up the exchanges, basically your your constituents have no access to the subsidies. Uh, and the, and and now uh, it's it's going on bonk. So uh, do right. do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So the this was the D.C. Circuit, and the panel of judges that was drawn from for the initial hearing it was uh, three Republican appointed ju- or two Republican appointed judges and one Democratically appointed judge, uh, and the it was two to one. The the judge judge who was appointed by a Democrat dissented from the majority opinion. Um, and so the government lost in this case. And one thing that you can do when you lose at the circuit level is appeal on bonk, which means that the case gets sent back to the full panel of active judges. And so the case will be heard again, um, I think later in December, in December, I believe is when it will be heard again um, by a much larger panel of judges. And that panel happens to skew towards the left. There are more judges who are appointed by Democrats and uh, judges who are appointed by Democrats and Republicans tend to interpret the law in different ways. Um, in the Fourth Circuit, the, the King case, uh, the decision was un- unanimous. And I think that all three judges in that case were appointed by Democrats. Um, although at lower levels, there have been Republican appointed judges who have ruled in favor of the government. Yeah. Um, so this case will be sent back on bonk. Um, in, in the technical jargon, the, the decision has been vacated the ruling has been vacated it will be heard again there will be a new ruling and uh the un- the way it's understood the new ruling will be in favor of the government um and so it creates this weird kind of um gray area where there is a circuit split but there isn't because it's about to be resolved and so should the supreme court hear the case because the supreme court often does hear cases if circuit courts which are the highest level below the supreme court um, are split on an issue. So technically, like a, a division in opinions exists, but that one ruling has gone away because it's going to be heard on bonk. So right. it's not clear to me that the Supreme Court should take it up on split circuit grounds. And so we know that the Supreme Court did not take up gay marriage um, for this term. Like they denied seven petitions. And Jonathan Adler, who is a law professor at Case Western, and also one of the real architects of this Holbig King lawsuit, um, he actually wrote on his blog in the Washington Post, I'm not surprised that they didn't take it up because there was no circuit split. So I don't understand really for the purposes of Holbig and King, whether a circuit split exists if the ruling was vacated. Like that, that is the thing I've actually been meaning to ask somebody yeah. who would know better than me. Um, <laughs> And I'm not sure. Uh, the Supreme Court doesn't need a circuit split. They they could take it if they just think the issue is important enough. Yeah. Um, but they also might punt the issue for, for the future, uh, to take it up in the future. And so it's just not clear to me. We'll know sometime by mid-November whether the Supreme Court plans to hear it this year. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think – even though the, the the decision was vacated, the, the opinion mm-hmm. still holds, right? So the, right. the 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 opinion is still there. So I don't know. You know, I guess if if you look at it and say, well, the the this this opinion uh, so it, it's, it's still there regardless of the of the ruling. Maybe there is a circuit split, but like you said, it's it's very ambiguous. And what what constitutes an important case is obviously also very ambiguous because I would have thought that the issue of gay marriage was pretty right. damn important. Right. And I think that most of the country would agree with you. Like most of the country has actually been following that. Unlike this case that um, I I find myself explaining to people all the time, just because I like to talk about it and nobody else does. Um, So I I do think it'll be interesting to see what the Supreme Court does, but if they choose not to take it up this year, that doesn't mean that it won't ever see the Supreme Court because there are two other lower cases that are still progressing through the judicial system. Um, those are Indiana versus IRS and Pruitt versus uh, Burwell. Burwell, not not Sebelius anymore. Yeah. Burwell, um, and so that is Oklahoma. And Oklahoma is Pruitt. Pruitt is Oklahoma's Pruitt is Oklahoma. attorney general. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and he, I think, was. Did he make you know, the he chaos the first... argument? 
I don't remember what argument has been, he made. I think that I was trying to decide who filed the case first. I think Indiana might have actually filed the case first, but it's taking the longest. Mm. Um, well, that, that would make sense. That's the IRS. One of the two of them filed the case first. Like King and Halbig were later cases that came up. Yeah, um, yeah. They're, all, they're all progressing on the same grounds. But um, the Indiana case, I, I asked, uh, or I, I went to a debate where Jonathan Adler was actually arguing in favor of this case. Um, and he said that the Indiana case, even though it's still at the district court level, is in this, like, if it were to get to the circuit court level, it's in the circuit court that might be the most receptive to mm-hmm. the plaintiff's arguments. So if the Supreme Court is waiting for a true circuit split, that wouldn't be reversed by going back on bonk. Uh, they might get it from Indiana, but that might take a few years and we're not sure. So ah. it becomes a question of whether the Supreme Court wants to wait for that to happen or whether they accept that that is, you know, going to happen in the future and we should just deal with it now. Um it's not clear. And it's also not clear what would happen if this went to the Supreme Court, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's tempting to say that, you know, Republicans would, would interpret the law as, as we expect them to. Democrats would interpret the law as, as, as we expect them to. But you you can have a split. It's 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 a really unique uh, court right now where if if it remains the same, um, when, if, if, if the case uh, does does go to SCOTUS, then it's it's really anybody's guess. Right. I, I'm, yeah. I, I I don't think anyone can be certain that they'd uphold the uh, the, the petitioners or, or the mm-hmm. government. It uh it would it would be it would be a gamble. I mean I I don't think anyone expected the results of the uh, of, of of the 2012 ruling to be to be what they were, where um the, the Medicaid expansion was was the part that that, that right. was weakened and the individual mandate was completely upheld. Right. On top of which, everyone thought Kennedy was the swing vote, right. and then Chief Justice Roberts ended up being. <laughs> the one who sided with the Democrats. So yeah, I mean, I've talked to a number of legal scholars about this and it's really not clear what the Supreme Court would do. Um, It's pretty likely that, you know, we would have four on each side, um, the four conservative justices who sided against the Affordable Care Act in the first place, who who had wanted to strike down the mandate. Um, they, They would probably, given their way of approaching the law, it's likely that they would side with the plaintiffs. Um, and the converse is true of the, the sure Democrats on the court. Um, but it's, it's really unclear to me what, who would be the swing vote and what they would decide. Um, because I think that there are, there is a solid defense. I don't know, um, how well it's been made in the media, but there's a, a good defense that if you look at the law as a whole and not this one piece in isolation, um, this one piece that people point to as, you know, according to the plain text of this one piece of the law, this is what was intended. Um, The full law gives a picture that makes it seem like subsidies were intended to flow to all of the the states. And that has seemed to be the understanding of everybody who followed the uh, development of the law back in, you know, 2009, 2010. Um, So, so, it's this is something that worries me as somebody who supports the law, as somebody who thinks that subsidies were intended on all of the states exchanges. This is a lawsuit that worries me. Um, and I think we're going to hear a lot more about it. I just don't know when. Yeah, I I, I, I sort of agree. I, I sort of just wonder, um, you know, how 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 much how much we're, we're letting Congress get away with. Right. So the the fact that you have this this question of what what that part of the law actually says and uh whether whether that's the intent but part of that is just sloppy drafting i i, I mean i i i agree i think that, that that the intent is what was that everyone should be getting the subsidies regardless of whether it's a state or federal exchange mm-hmm. but it was clearly clearly very poorly drafted and part of that is that it, it was pushed through uh you know very, very politically when when scott brown uh got, got elected uh, suddenly the, the, there was no, uh, real, the, uh, ma- majority that, that, that they can count on. They knew Scott Brown would likely oppose the law. So they realized we just got to get this through as soon as possible. And, and that's what they did. Um, uh, you, you tend to come out with, with laws that are difficult to interpret and a law as political as this, as partisan as this. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's expected. I, as, as, as a policy wonk, I don't want to see, uh, bad policy just because of a legal technicality, but mm-hmm. as uh, as 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 libertarian as someone who believes in 
smaller, uh, you know, lean, more efficient government, however you want to uh, characterize it. It just it worries me what we let Congress get away with. Right. I, I mean, I understand that even if I don't agree. <laughs> um, I think that it's fair to say that a lesson here is there are consequences to unorthodox methods of passing law like this. <laughs> This was not passed the traditional way. Um, and I might be, you know, as a supporter of the law, thankful that it was passed however it was passed. But I, I think that there's something to be said for there are consequences to not using the traditional uh, methods of passing a law. And this is one of those consequences. The law was never cleaned up in committee. So yeah. things like this, issues like this that I'm sure bureaucrats knew about before the media started talking about them. Yeah, they it's, they just hoped it would end up being swept under the rug and people wouldn't uh, wouldn't pay too much attention to it. Right. But the media will go for whatever makes headlines. Of course. And of course. This has made headlines and it will continue to make headlines. Well, and J- Jonathan Adler is a good lawyer. Got to give him that. <sighs> he is a good lawyer. Yeah. Um I mean, their case it, it's I, I've been following this for longer than most people just because I've actually had this taught in some of my graduate classes um as a as you know, how, how to use litigation as a policy strategy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's very interesting from a kind of clinical perspective, but it ha- it, if it goes in favor of the plaintiffs, it could have such catastrophic implications across the country. I, I, it's millions of people. I don't remember how many millions, but it's millions yeah. of people who could lose, yeah, lose there, their subsidies. Yeah, there, there are a lot of people that, that get hurt by it. Um, I, I'm I'm not entirely convinced that if if the subsidies get pulled that all, all those people would be harmed. I think that for for a lot of governors, um, it suddenly becomes a political liability uh, to to, That's to actually have all those people lose uh, lo- lose lose their subsidies, lose coverage that that they have. So especially if this is uh, in 2016, you know, 2016, 2017, you've got potentially over 20 million people and. You're you're not going to go and tell those people, hey, so we're we're fighting for you and we just made sure that you don't have access to these credits. Right, right. We're fighting for you and also we're taking away your health yeah. insurance. That, that doesn't play well. Um, no, I agree. And, and there's also there's a potential fix, it sounds like, where states could somehow in a roundabout way contract with healthcare.gov. Yeah. So it's technically for legal purposes, a state based exchange, but they don't actually need to change their infrastructure a whole lot. Um, and that's that's the problem, really. It, even with you know, ensure even with governors having the sudden incentive to establish state exchanges, that's not something you can scale up overnight. States had four years to get these things up and running, and it was still a bit of a disaster in some states. Um, so, yeah, if there if there's a if there's a fairly easy way around it, like that's one thing. If it's something where states really need to set up exchanges, that's a completely different issue. But um, I guess we'll have a better idea. Well, we'll know in November if we'll know this year. Is the bottom exactly, line. exactly. <laughs> it, 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 it may take another uh, year or two to, uh, to, mm-hmm. to fully play out. And the Supreme Court could always just say, you know, nope, we're not, we're not going to take this. And then uh, status quo. Right, right. Status quo is a strong thing. <laughs> All right. Well, I think it's been about an hour. Yeah, yeah. So and, we should probably wrap this up. But and I think we we got through all the all the topics. We did. 